while back, I was heading out on a business trip, and uh, the flight was delayed an hour and a half. And it was interesting because as the, uh, the gate uh, agent announced that it was time to uh, head out to JFK, she says it in this tone of voice, all right, JFK travelers, let's go. <laughs> it was funny, it's like, did we do something wrong? <laughs> you know, why are you annoyed at us? And I found myself later thinking, if this was Southwest Airlines, they wouldn't be talking to us this way. And then I found myself thinking about, what is it that Southwest Airlines seems to know that most other airlines don't seem to know? How did they know how to create an emotional climate where employees love serving the customer? And even though I'm sure working with tired, grumpy air travel customers is not the easiest job in the world, to say the least, they're always chipper and cheery and upbeat. And I think of Southwest Airlines as the epitome of a resilient workforce and a recession-proof workforce. And here's what I mean. A resilient workforce are employees who are able to, regardless of how demanding, high pressure, how difficult the day-to-day -day work is, they're able to be cheery and upbeat. They don't get into this petty, negative way of interacting. And they're able to give great customer service or patient care, and they work well together. But also, a recession-proof workforce in the bigger picture, it's a workforce that even during really difficult times, whether difficult times in the industry or difficult times in the economy as a whole, they're still able to maintain a positive attitude or as what Southwest Airlines describes it as a warrior spirit. Now what's interesting about Southwest Airlines in the difference knowing how to create that type of emotional climate can make is that having a resilient workforce and having a positive emotional culture doesn't just translate into great customer service, it also translates into operational superiority. So those of you here in manufacturing, that it makes a huge difference. I'll give you just one example. Southwest Airlines is able to turn airplanes around in 15 minutes. The next closest competitor it takes them 10 minutes longer. And you think about the incredible operational advantage of being able to work in that synergistically. And they are, attribute that to their synergistic relationships. And they obviously have invested a lot of time and effort into creating that kind of climate. Now related to recession-proof workforce, when people are in a, a frightened, survival, kind of huddled mentality, they're not into how can I help you, how can we work together. Obviously, it's all about how do I survive and not get laid off. And so the things that we'll be talking about and exploring together this morning will make a huge difference not only in your ability to have employees have high morale during difficult times, but also give great customer service, great patient care, those of you in healthcare. Also, interdepartmental synergy, higher productivity, if you're all involved in safety issues, the things that we talk about also reduce safety-related uh, costs. So anything and everything related to bringing out the best employees, this relates to. Now, to get us started, I want you to, uh, to share with you an example of a resilient workforce. And as I'm sharing this with you, here's two things I want you to be thinking about, and then I'm going to ask you to, at your tables, work with us. Number one, what do you think this company does to create a climate that fosters this kind of response? And I'll tell you this when I finish the story again. So I'm like, what was that? Okay, so number one, what do they do to foster this kind of response? And number two, to ask yourself, hmm, are there things that we do in our organization that make this kind of response not really likely? Okay, so here's the story. Years ago, I was talking with the president of Fantastic Foods, and they caught my eye because I'm always on the lookout for organizations that do things well. 
that know how to create a can-do workforce. And the founder of Fantastic Foods worked in a, Mont a Montessori school. He's either a teacher or the principal. And he took those Montessori principles for bringing out the best in kids into the workplace. And he embedded them in the culture of Fantastic Foods. So I was talking with the president of this company, and I asked him, like, you've seen the benefits of, of addressing the people side of business. And I'm curious, what message do you have for senior level executives who think, or even frontline managers and supervisors who think addressing the emotional side of business, addressing the people side is like touchy-feely, warm, fuzzy, if we had time for that stuff, we'd do it, but hey, we've got business to run. I'm sure you've worked with people who have that mentality. And so he paused for a moment and said, what I'm to say. He said, well, I guess the best way to, for me to explain the difference it makes is to, to give you an example. And this is the story he told me, how they had just closed this seven-figure account with a, a Canadian uh, grocery store chain. And so obviously, they wanted to please their brand new customer. Well, what happened was, the product that this customer bought, one of the ingredients was stuck in customs, and it wasn't going to arrive at their factory in time for them to produce the product and get it there on time. So being late on your first delivery is not a way to endure, endear yourself to your, your new customer. So they're really concerned about this. Well, the plot thickens because the employees on the production line, more specifically, it was the uh, second shift employees, hear about what, what's happening. And they huddle together and say, here's the deal. This is what's going on. What do you think we should do? And so the, I guess it was the team lead of the second shift goes to the, the, um, the president and the senior team and says, you know, I, you know, I know it would be really expensive because what the plan was was to freight it in on the rails once it went through customs. He said, you know, I know it'd be like ultra expensive if we flew it in, but at the moment it breaks through customs, if we fly it in, even though it's really expensive, we'd be able to get it out the door and then, you know, have a happy customer. And we'll stay here for as long as it takes to get it done. So the senior team's like, you're right, let's do it. So they chartered an airplane as soon as that, that ingredient broke through customs, right into the, the plant, and they worked through the night. And then the next morning, when the trucks arrived, ready for the Thai noodle soup, it was good to go. Okay. Think about the clues that I shared with you, okay? So here's what I want to ask you to do. Five minutes at your tables to brainstorm what do you think this organization did, does, to create an environment where employees had that attitude versus uh, I could care less. That's, your, that's for you to worry about. You know, that's what they pay you the big bucks for, attitude. Or that's not in my job description, attitude. It's so prevalent in so many organizations. So number one, what do you think they did, management did, to create that kind of environment? And then number two, if you feel like it and you get to this point at your table, are there any things that, that you notice in your organization that is being done that would not make employees likely to have that response, that kind of can-do, let's get the job done response, okay? Five minutes and then we'll compare notes. <coughs> So, what do you think they did to create the atmosphere where their employees had that sort of can-do attitude? Who wants to start? I'm sorry?